Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, White House Deputy Coordinator for Monkeypox. He talks about efforts to contain the monkeypox outbreak in the U.S. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. The Biden administration has urged all Americans to take monkeypox seriously. It's a rare infectious viral disease. The U.S. has the highest number of known cases of any country right now, and the World Health Organization has declared the recent outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. And joining us today is Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, the White House National Monkeypox Response Deputy Coordinator. He also serves as the Director of the Division of HIV Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control. Well, thank you, Dr. Daskalakis, uh, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to talk. That's great. Uh, let's start uh, by asking you to update us on the latest situation with the spread, the vaccination and treatment for monkeypox. We understand the U.S. now has one death likely attributed to monkeypox. So I'll start. So um, our current case count is 18,989 cases. Um, there is one case that's being investigated. So um, they're still working to get clarity. Um, the individual had multiple medical problems. And so they're still looking to evaluate the actual role of monkeypox in that person's demise. And so, of course, we send all of our condolences to the family and um, you know continue to see um, what the outcome of the epidemiologic evaluation is. Um, we continue to work um, really tirelessly to increase um, really a couple of swaths of work that are important to the monkeypox outbreak. So the first is vaccine. So we, um, through a uh, FDA emergency use authorization of the vaccine that was uh, published on August 9th, or that was, uh, that was confirmed on August 9th, um, we're able to extend the number of doses that could be uh, extracted from a single vial of vaccine um, by uh, changing the route of this of, of administration. So rather than subcutaneously, um, it is an int it is an intradermal vaccine, and we're really seeing great uptake across the country. Which means that what vaccine we do have, we're able to extend. It's up to five doses in real life. It's closer to four for most people. Um, and also have worked really hard to increase production. Um, and that means both offshore um, at the uh, Bavaria Nordic plant in Denmark, but also just announced a fill and finish facility um, in Michigan. Um, it's, uh, it's, it is um, a facility that in effect bottles the vaccine. So it's, it's actually usable. So that means that we are increasing production domestically, um, increasing production abroad, mm -hmm. have more vaccine flowing as as well as extending what we've got. Testing continues to uh, to sort of uh, become more accessible. We're up to eighty thousand tests that can be conducted on uh, any week in the United States. That compares to six thousand at the beginning of the outbreak. So a lot of progress there. We continue to evaluate the investigational drug Tpox or Tecovirumab. Um, the exciting news that is that in a few days the the NIH sponsored studies will launch of Tecovirumab while we continue to work on the uh, expanded access. Uh, IND. Um, one of the sort of big uh, news flashes is that um, it used to take several hours to complete the IND paperwork for TPOX from the perspective of access. Now it's down to about 15 to 30 minutes per patient. So really exciting. Also have pre-positioned a lot of the drug closer to people so that everything happens much faster. And then lastly, continuing to do the work to provide really clear messaging. Um, and that really means being frank, um, really focusing on the exposures and, and, and really working very intentionally to not generate stigma um, as we increase awareness of monkeypox across the country. Well, there's some very good news there uh, around testing and vaccines and treatment. And we certainly have been very uh, appreciative of being able to get the vaccine and to uh, administer it at sites in our community health center sites around uh, Connecticut. Uh, but I know uh, you've announced some plans to support large LGBTQ plus events and some equity interventions to reach communities that are at highest risk of contracting the virus. Can you tell us a little more about these plans. What, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to uh, make up for something perhaps that we haven't been doing and maybe share an example of how they're going to work? 
Great. So I'll say that the, that we're not really making up for anything. What we're doing is finally able to do extended work because we're not in a scarcity model for vaccine anymore. And so I think that the very first step in the equity interventions um, is not one that is one of the pilots, but it's actually making sure we have enough vaccine to be able to uh, to really work hard to get it everywhere in the arms it needs to get. So bringing it closer to people as opposed to having people try to find vaccines. So that's all very exciting. We have two different equity pilots that are happening at the same time. The first equity pilot, I like to call the macro pilot, which is large events that uh, that come upon jurisdictions that focus on LGBTQ AI plus individuals. And so there um, are several examples of, of, of events that we're looking at. So I'll give you the short list. We've done Charlotte Pride in North Carolina. Um, and there they almost did 600 vaccines in folks who were attending various Pride events. They actually not only focused it on Pride, but focused it on venues and, and events that focused on, uh, on Black and Brown people who are coming to really try to increase the, um, the reach of uh, equity access of the vaccine. This weekend, Labor Day weekend, um, there will be two other events. One is going to be in New Orleans called Southern Decadence. Uh, and they're doing just an amazing combination of events. Um, they're, they're actually going to venues and small events. And again, really focused on the communities who are overrepresented in the outbreak, but underrepresented in the vaccine counts. Um, but also they're, they're doing what they're calling a health hub, which is um, they are um, putting testing as well as vaccination um, right at the mouth of the uh, Louis Armstrong Park. So very prominent, very central to the event. So um, they actually have CDC folks on the ground as well who are helping them. So it is a, a, a great example of this all hands on deck strategy um, for these large events. The other one is Black Pride in Atlanta, and that is very specifically designed to be an equity intervention um, with a lot of focus on events um, that are really uh, geared to attract um, uh, LGBTQ AI plus people of color. So, oh, and we also announced Oakland Pride Festival. And so that's also coming to more to come. We, the micro version is what if you don't have an event with 50,000 people? What if you have smaller ideas? Well, big ideas for smaller groups of people that may benefit um, equity. And so the second um, equity innovation pilot really focuses on providing uh, a supply of vaccine to jurisdictions to really be a little bit of a lab to see what, uh, what works best to get vaccine in people's arms. Um, and so we're going to allocate for both of those 10,000 vials. It's a pilot, and if it goes well, we'll obviously extend it. Um, but that's really what the strategy is, to try to you know, do a real equity intervention, which is what can we do to augment what's happening in a jurisdiction so that we can reach people in a way that they're not being reached by the sort of industrial strength strategies for vaccine distribution. You know, I want to pull the thread on that sort of intervention yeah. strategy because we've seen monkeypox cases slowing down in the United States. Vaccines and uh, community outreach efforts are leading to declines in New York City. We see that wastewater samples in San Francisco show that the concentration of monkeypox virus has stabilized in recent weeks. And in Europe, new cases appear to be falling. Yet we have students returning to college campuses, uh, and that poses a risk. So maybe down to that granular level, what, what's happening with outreach to, to young people? Uh, certainly the big events matter, but I think that granular nature and also just in this context of it's not sort of in my social media, uh, you know, line of sight or I'm not seeing it on, uh, on other medias. Yeah, so we're... Um... We've had some great experiences working with colleges and universities as well as um, as K through 12 schools. Um, there's been a, a, a sort of significant swath of work that's been done to make sure that the word is getting out. So some examples include um, special sessions that have happened with um, university and college health services, with university and college heads, as well as work that's happened um, in sort of K through 12. Included in the K through 12 work is a um, fact sheet that was um, released, sort of an FAQ to focus on some of the most important questions. And that's actually gone out to uh, many jurisdictions and to their, their school systems. Um, so we are continuing to do engagements. In fact, today, um, uh, Admiral Levine from HHS did one with university heads. And so we have created a package of guidance 
that uh, is sort of the suite of guidance that when brought together really defines like what strategies ought to be on campuses and, and, and in schools. So for instance, the university guidance really includes congregate settings guidance, but also our safer sex guidance. Um, since it's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, that it, we have to give up the package of what would work in the venue. And so lots of outreach, lots of engagement and clear, concise guidance that is available to um, all of the universities. Also, I think we've been really clear about messaging that uh, monkeypox is something that can affect anyone. But at the end of the day, over 90% of the cases are among gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, often associated with sexual transmission. So um, though we don't, um, though, though other ways of getting monkeypox include other ways of other sort of forms of skin to skin contact, touching um, objects that someone with monkeypox's lesions have touched, and also rarely through through close contact of, of respiratory secretions. At the end of the day, looking at this epidemiology, the, the skin to skin contact associated with sex is the most common. And I think that that should give people awareness of, of, the, of the disease with also addressing some of the anxiety that it's that there's ways that are way efficient for transmitting the virus and ways that really aren't. Well, Dimitri, there was really a very moving story in the New York Times from a patient of yours. Uh, and he said that when he was diagnosed, that uh, you really tried to console him, uh, support him, assure him that things would work out. Tell us more about your experience and what you're hearing from your colleagues about the personal side of treating uh, this virus. What are patients expressing in terms of a sense of shame or stigma? Or have we moved on from that? Yeah, no, I, I think that first I'll start by saying that governmental public health and government needs to be the role model in terms of communicating in a way that is non-stigmatizing. And I'll say that I think I'm pretty proud of the way that we've worked uh, ab about giving information about exposures and about this virus without, um, without creating documents and guidance that stigmatizes individuals or groups. With that said, there's definitely the experience of stigma and the pain of, of actually uh, sort of experiencing this infection. And I feel, um, and I've heard um, from many, um, you know, that, you know, it's, it's um, A, stigmatizing, B, like realistically speaking, a lot of people uh, experience significant pain, whether that's because of the oropharyngeal lesions or potentially the peri, the, 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 the anorectal lesions or the genital lesions. So, you know, it's really um, about not only sort of treating um, the virus, if, they, if folks qualify um, for tecoviramab or TPOX, but also like addressing the sort of psychological and pain issues that really are things that we can do to improve um, how people um, persevere through this infection. So I think, you know, it's, it's I think as healthcare providers and public health practitioners, um, I think we need to be the leaders to make sure that we, uh, we mitigate stigma and work in ways to actually reduce stigma by actually not propagating it through the way that we talk about these, this infection. So, so important to, to reduce that stigma. And I want to get back to the answer you gave just a, a moment ago about sort of the def, uh, whether or not this monkeypox meets the definition of a sexually, uh, sexually transmitted disease. Indeed, most cases, as you had noted, have been linked to community of men having sex with men. Can you just clear that up? Is monkeypox an STD? Yeah, so I feel like it's a little bit of a semantic answer in terms of whether it's an STD or not. And I think that the, that the official jury is still out in terms of how to define it. Yeah. But I think that it's really important to acknowledge that the most efficient mechanism of transmission we have in this outbreak is sex and specifically um, occurring in sex between men. Now, that could be because of the social network. I think we're still learning about this infection. But ultimately, I think that the guidance for folks, for providers, as well as for, for people who could potentially be exposed to monkeypox remains the same. If you're at risk, get vaccinated. Um, and so I think we have pretty clear guidance on that. And it's not just about vaccine. Um, but since this is sexually transmitted, you know, there are ways to change behavior temporarily as we get the immune wall built around the population um, to actually reduce the possibility of acquiring monkeypox. And, you know, I think in a recent MMWR that was published now, I think almost a week ago, um, you know, we have good data from surveys from the Amos study that um, gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men have changed their behavior because of monkeypox. Um, they report 50% fewer one-time partnerships, 50% um, have reported um, 
uh, of not having multiple partners um, because, and specifically in response to monkeypox. So I think um, whether it's an, a sexually transmitted disease, a sexually transmissible disease, I think at the end of the day, the advice is the same. Great. Well, Dimitri, uh, I know that uh, you obviously are an expert in HIV uh, care and prevention, and the numbers uh, do show that a significant number of patients with monkeypox are also HIV positive. I wonder if you could uh, share a little bit with us about that connection. Uh, are people more vulnerable who are HIV positive? Is somebody's HIV uh, clinical status relevant to how severe the case is? Maybe share your thoughts on that. Thanks, Margaret. Really a question near and dear to my heart here. So I think from the perspective of HIV, we know that our, there are some studies that show that individuals with, living with HIV could have more severe disease. Generally speaking, um, the stronger someone's immune system is and the better their HIV is, is managed from the perspective of viral suppression, so being undetectable, the more they're going to approximate someone without HIV in terms of the way that they, were, they, um, they manifest their monkeypox disease. Um, with that said, um, regardless of T-cell count or viral suppression, uh, it's really important that people living with HIV who are at risk for monkeypox get vaccinated. And so now with increasing vaccine supplies, I would say that the message is so virally suppressed or not, T-cells of 500 or T-cells of 50 get vaccinated because that's going to be important in protecting you. Um, so I think you know, there, there will be more data coming. So I would just watch this space closely um, around the, uh, the issue of how people living with HIV uh, may have a different experience with monkeypox. You know, uh, Dimitri, I want to talk to you about uh, your work globally uh, in, in terms of monkeypox. Are you having conversations uh, with uh, colleagues ar around the globe and uh, their <clears throat> certainly suffering from the lack of vaccine, certainly in Africa, you know, this is a disease, uh, one of those rare diseases of public health significance, right? And that was really sort of missed by, by CDC, by others here, didn't see, we don't seem to be prepared. And I'm wondering what your sense of uh, what's happening globally with monkeypox, how well it's being addressed. And I think one thing we've learned from COVID is that these are global uh, issues and that we really need to solve these problems globally, not only locally. And of course, locally, it sounds like you are doing a great job in terms of leadership. But talk us a little bit about your conversations that are going on with colleagues around the globe and uh, what, what, what we're learning. Yeah, so there, the administration is really dedicated to making sure that that we control this epidemic, this outbreak in the U.S., and and also make sure that we're addressing issues around the world, not only for the U.S. because obviously, if we address issues around the world, introductions become less common here, but also for the sake of the uh, uh, the, uh, the other parts of the world. And so, one of I think um, a a clear signal um, of the importance is that um, part of the monkeypox um, response team includes a global group, um, so with, with leaders from UNAID, UNAID as well as from CDC. And so I think we're, we're actively having conversations about what support can look like. And there's already been, I think, support from the perspective of vaccine that's been provided. So this is a space to watch really carefully as we, um, as we explore how we can best support monkeypox interventions outside of the U.S. Well, Dimitri, I wonder if I can build on that to just ask you a little bit about uh, who are the people? that are doing all of this work. You talked about uh, the, the big events uh, that are going on in Atlanta and in other uh, large urban areas. You've talked about global work. Uh, we know that we need to pay attention to all of the states, right? It's not just the big states and, and workforce everywhere is such an issue. Maybe just give our uh, listeners some insights into what is the new CDC workforce boots on the ground of people who can go out into communities around the country and educate and uh, uh, reassure and also deliver vaccines, tests, whatever it is. Maybe talk a little bit about that with sure. us. Sure. I'll start by saying as someone who was a, uh, a local health official, I used to always think of myself as a CDC and a HRSA extender. Um, so it's like one big team. And so part of part of the experience is that we're really working with our local jurisdictions to do the work on the ground. And again, public health is always a very local experience. And so really making sure that we provide vaccine and the technical resources that are needed for uh, for jurisdictions to do work. Also, I think um, I cannot possibly be on this call without shouting out the community health centers and say that we're so critical in the work. And we're really excited that 
that through HRSA, there's also a allocation of vaccine that has gone to community health centers. And that I think will increase as, as vaccine uh, availability increases over time. So that's really great news. Um, definitely from the CDC perspective, like there are responders on the ground. And so for instance, in New Orleans, there is a team that's been deployed that is really helping to sort of orchestrate with New Orleans. It's not a CDC takeover uh, of New Orleans, but it is it is a hand in glove uh, uh, interaction between state, city and federal and the community health centers and the, and the community-based organizations that are really really the boots on the ground that are, are reaching the communities that we need to reach the most. So I mean, I've got to say, like having come from an experience of a local jurisdiction and then um, also um, having conducted a lot of outbreak responses, this is when the magic happens, um, when you have all of the various components of government and community coming together. And I think that um, these equity interventions are such a great example of that because you know the community asked for us to do it, and then we figured out a way to do it from the perspective of vaccine allocation, and then the partnership got deeper and deeper to the point where it really feels like one team New Orleans, one team Atlanta, one team Oakland, and uh, and before a team Charlotte. So really exciting, and I can't wait to see what happens with the micro ones, the micro events, because like that, I think we're going to really see. Um, a, a lot of effectiveness, but then also we're going to learn some great ideas that other folks can adopt. You know, I really like the, the word partnership here. And, and in public health, there's always uh, questions and criticisms. And as you know, some have said CDC has not learned from its COVID mistakes around testing as it faces monkeypox. But it sounds like, and maybe you can assure Americans that really the brightest minds and best strategies are in place. And it's, it, it's really an opportunity for um, uh, partners to come together and, and work collaboratively on this. Sure, I'll start by saying that um, having worked on a lot of outbreak responses, you know, measles in New York City, I was the incident commander for COVID-19 for about eight months in New York City. The speed at which this is sort of moving is pretty astounding. So, uh, but I'll also, so for instance, testing is a great example. So within a week of the first case, conversations were already happening with commercial labs to move into commercialization. And then within a month, it, ha it started to happen. So that is actually really fast and really builds on the lessons of COVID, number one. Like the other example is, I, I think, um, you know, the lessons that we've learned not from COVID, but HIV. And so when you look at the messaging and the strategies to sort of reach people, those are hard learned, hard learned lessons from 41 years of experience. And what I, what I say using my HIV hat is it only takes one, one moment to create stigma that can last for decades. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we were so intentional and, I, and the we, I mean the big we about trying to really be intentional about, about how not to attach an infection to an identity, but really focus on how exposures happen. So I think there's a lot of lessons um, that we pull from everything that we do in outbreak response. But I feel like when you look at this, it's really moving with a great amount of urgency. And I mean, I'm excited to be a part of it here um, at the White House. I was excited to be a part of it at the beginning. And I think that you know we're starting to reap, I think some, I mean, guarded optimism, but starting to reap some of the benefits of the work that's happened. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Daskalasis, Dimitri, many thanks for your time and public service and for both your passion and compassion uh, in this work. And thank you to our audience for being here. Remember, you can learn more about Conversations on Healthcare or sign up for our email updates at www.chtradio.com. Thanks again, Dimitri. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for being the leading edge of care in the U.S. With, at the community health center. So we really rely on you uh, to just make sure that we're, we're caring for our people. So thank That's you. That's great. Great. Good seeing you.